Ming Galapa, welcome to the Webby Shop 2022 series on nurturing ourselves as peace builders. The United Board organized these virtual workshops or Webby Shops in response to Myanmar educators' request for more tools in peace education. They have realized that doing whole person education also means being agents of peace in their classrooms and communities. Each video has been edited for brevity and is made available for educators who wish to integrate peace education in their teaching. Once again, welcome! going to let you look at some words for a minute and then turn them off but you cannot write during that minute okay next here we go I see most of you are ready please look at these words I'm going to give you a minute do not write anything down yet just look at the screen okay now follow the instructions on the screen Write down as many words as you can remember from what was on the screen. So <laughs> let's check how many people wrote down the word bed. And then how many people now remember that the word bed was there? Maybe you didn't write it down, but now you remember, oh, yes, bed, bed was there, okay? Okay, so bed is Definitely a word from the list. How about the word blanket? How many people wrote down the word blanket? All right. How many people now remember blanket was one of the words? How about the word dark? Okay. And how many people now remember the word dark? Now that you saw other people and we're talking about dark, who remembers that dark was one of the words? Can you put your hand up? Maybe you didn't write it down. Okay, now how about sleep? Who wrote down the word sleep? Okay, who remembers now the word sleep? Okay, so let's have a look at the list. Can you find here the word sleep? Why do we think about sleep even if the word wasn't there? So actually, we're doing this crazy exercise because this reminds us how our brains work. So when we are thinking about the conflict, the violence that we're dealing with, we actually have association of those words. So sometimes people say the conflict is about religion, but maybe the conflict is not really about religion. It's about something behind that. So very often we have that sense that we have understood something, but without really investigating and interrogating more deeply what it's really about. So when we're talking about the conflict and the situation in Myanmar, we often need to be asking more questions, to be going more deeply. So it's very easy to say the conflict is about ethnicity, the conflict is about religion, the conflict is about this and that. But actually, sometimes we need to look more deeply as we discussed last week. Is it about constitution? Is it about power? Is it about ego or control or resources or economics? So this is just little exercise, but it's to help remind us that even though all the words were about sleep, actually the word sleep wasn't there. Sometimes there are many things that cloud our thinking and our judgment, and we have to really go more deeply and analyze more carefully. So I just want to show you one more. I want you to look at this picture and tell me what can you see? Actually, if you look carefully and very closely, this picture, the black camels that you are looking at is actually the shadows. But if you look again, the angle of the photograph from the aeroplane is taking a photo of the white camels and the shadow is what you can see. So 
actually this photograph was taken uh, by a photographer called George. He flew over the desert and he took this photo of the white camels. But because of the angle of the sun, the shadow reflected onto the onto the sand. And so what we can see is the black shadow. So why is this in any way related to conflict and conflict analysis and conflict transformation? Why am I sharing this with you? The idea that when we look at something, it's not always what we think it is. And sometimes we have to look more closely, just as we did with the sleep exercise. When we're trying to understand what's happening, what's happening in the country, we can read the new light of Myanmar, we can read the Irrawaddy, can read different perspectives, but actually we have to analyze more deeply and go more carefully. And I think you've all had the experience of white people like me coming into Myanmar and telling you, this is what your conflict is about. But that's because often they look at the shadows, not look at the real animal or the real conflict, <laughs> what it's really about. So at the moment, for example, many, many countries are discussing about election 2023 in Myanmar. But in many ways, that's the shadow. It's not the real issue. And so as we discussed last week, we talked about conflict, structural violence. We talked about cultural violence. So sometimes it's easy for people looking at a conflict to get distracted by the shadows, to not see the real story. So this is about our perceptions, how our opinions are formed. And so actually I'm very grateful that Tunda has also given us the image of camels as a source of inspiration for resilience and strength. Equally, these camels have taught us that sometimes when we just look at a picture quickly, we can get the wrong understanding. And we need to be careful when we're analysing, when we're listening to information, when we're hearing different stories to analyse more deeply, to look more closely, to ask more critical questions because sometimes that can lead us down the wrong path. That's also what we can see here is the person who took the photo was flying very far above the situation, not in the situation, not on the ground with the camels. And the sun was distorting what you could see. So sometimes this is what I think is also happening in Myanmar now is that Ming Online is telling the world something, others are telling the world something, and sometimes the information is distorted, sometimes people are distracted by the wrong issues. And it's very dangerous when we're talking about conflict for people to get on the wrong track, the wrong intervention, the wrong peace accord. So let's just look at one more. I want to ask you, what can you see here? Let me turn it for you. What do you see now? A horse. But can you still <laughs> see a frog? Can everybody see both frog and horse? I'll turn it back for you if you turn it back. So the question is, is it a frog or a horse? Both can be true. So same picture but two realities. And so when you look at a situation, what yeah. changes your perception? How do you, how do you look from a different angle? How is our perception shaped? How do we, how does perception come about? So uh -huh. what you notice is that when I showed you the picture and you were trying to look at it from another way, many of you turned your perspective, yeah? You changed the angle of your head. <laughs> so when we look at conflict, sometimes we also have to look from other angles to find the solution. And what yeah. we're talking about today is conflict transformation, is how do we, Take a situation that you are living in now and try to turn it into something positive, something constructive, something better. But before we talk about that, if we don't understand that our minds can play tricks on us, you know, is that if you only listen to Ming online right now, you will believe everything in Myanmar is good, that he is saving the country, that he is going to give you a very serious election and that 
you will all be very happy soon once he eliminate all the terrorists. And to be honest, if you also only listen to NUG, you will believe that, oh, the country is also going to be very good, that they can solve the humanitarian issues and the constitution issues. And maybe both are true. I don't know. But the question is not political. The question is about your perception. The question is, every time you look at something, are you looking deeply enough? Are you asking enough questions? Are you really finding out what's going on here? And what I can share with you from different conflicts around the world is very often when the international community comes, they look at the conflict very above the surface, very superficially, not deeply. And that's why very often different peace agreements, different peace processes fail because they're not dealing with the real issue. They're just dealing with the shadows of the issues. They are not understanding that maybe for Burmese people and Karen people, there are two realities in one story, just like the, the horse and the frog, that the horse and the frog are both true and still exists in one entity together. So it's very, it's very like a um, frustrating thing because there is no one truth, no one black and white, no one clear perspective, but many different perspectives. And that's how we can understand that conflict is actually difficult because in country like Myanmar, people have very different experiences of the same history. For some people, Aung San Suu Kyi is a hero. For other people, she is a demon. For some people, the uh, revolution is the way forward. For other people, it's very threatening and scary. For some people, the choice about the future is to join with CDM. For other people, is to practice every day a different way of living. So it's very hard that there is no one right or one wrong. So what I want to for you to get from all of these things, from sleep exercise, from camels, from frogs and horses, is to understand that we have to be very critical, very thinking seriously, um, deeply, if we really want to address conflict and build peace. We cannot be just we are all love each other and that's good and off we go. Actually, conflict is very deep. That's why it takes 70 years, 80 years sometimes to resolve because it's a very complicated thing. And many realities exist at the same time. And the challenges in a conflict for one group versus another group, their reality is their perspective. That's right. And it doesn't mean that you have to agree with the other side. But if you can understand why do they do what they do, maybe it help us to find a way to resolve the conflict, yeah? We don't have to like what they think. We don't have to. But sometimes our perspective, our reality is shaped by history, by culture, by what we get taught, many things. When um, the young people were on the street calling for the responsibility to protect they were saying the United Nations has responsibility to protect us. We need your help. We need your help. And they have very good understanding of this principle of the UN, responsibility to protect. But the UN said that, no, in this situation, we cannot intervene. It's an internal problem. We cannot do that. So then we saw in some communities, people make their own defense force, their own people's defense force. Now, very popular, very common terminology, PDF, PDF. But the international community was very critical. Why these people are taking guns? And they said that to protect ourselves, to protect ourselves, because you didn't protect us. So there were two different understandings of what is PDF. The international community said that PDF is very dangerous, defensive, um, violent. And the people in community say that, but 
we are very vulnerable. We don't have any way to protect ourselves. So you didn't come and protect us. So this is two understandings of the same reality. Yes, it's very violent. Actually, it is. But then at the same time, because people felt vulnerable, yeah? So the perspective looking in from outside, oh, these people are bad. They are using violence to protect themselves. This is not good. But the people on the ground are saying that we are very scared. We want to protect ourselves. So not to start the conversation right or wrong about PDF, but just to show that two different perspectives about the same thing. So that way, sometimes very difficult to resolve because we have different understanding about same reality. Now I want to show you a framework that talks a little bit more about conflict transformation. And I'm sure in this room, there are many different political perspectives and many different ideas about the conflict right now. So I hope you forgive me if I'm saying something that upset you or is it different to your viewpoint about Myanmar because I'm also outsider. So I also have my own limited understanding what I can share. So let's have a look at this framework together. This framework comes from a man called John Paul Lederach. And I send you the article for you to read for this week and next week. He wrote a very famous book called Moral Imagination. And it's really about how do we transform conflicts? And I know last week you we were asking, what's the solution? What's the solution? What's the solution? So this framework, I wish, was a very easy solution, but it is a way of thinking about how do we transform these conflicts into something more positive? And this framework is a way that he tried to explain that. And it's a very complicated one. This is the picture of the book and the picture of the framework, but I'm going to try to explain it to you a little bit more piece by piece. So what he says is that in every conflict, it starts with one issue. So I hope you will forgive me because I'm going to talk a little bit about the coup last year, but the issue of the coup was really between Aung San Suu Kyi and Ming Online that he wanted to be president and she said no. So this is a beginning issue of the coup. But that issue exists within one relationship, a relationship between Ming Online and Aung San Suu Kyi, not a good relationship, but a relationship. It also exists between a relationship between Tap Mador and the National League for Democracy, NLD, it also exists between the relationship of the people and the military, the relationship of the ethnic people and the Burmese people. So relationship, no issue exists without relationship. We have to live in relationship all of the time. But also relationships in between us don't just happen without existing within a system or a subsystem. So the issue between Ming Online and Aung San Suu Kyi happened between them. They had a relationship, but their relationship was a political one. She was head of the political party. She had been, um, her party had won the election, but his party and his people had lost election. So the subsystem that it exists inside of is actually the political or election system. It didn't happen in the military system. It didn't happen in the health system or the education system. It happened inside the top level of political leadership. And as we discussed last week, that political system exists inside a much bigger system, the system of the constitution and the laws of the country. So if you think that on that day, February 1, there was a very small issue, but that small issue became very big because it exists inside all of these bubbles, that the issue might be about Aung San Suu Kyi saying no to him being president, but actually it's also about him not recognising the election about a constitution that allows the military inside the parliament. So many, many layers. 
So on February 1, we might think that this was the issue and we could have solved it very quickly. Maybe we could have said, hey, you know, let him be president or not let him be president or arrest him or anything. But that issue became bigger because of who they are and their relationship. It became bigger because they are political leaders and the election and it became bigger because of the constitution and so on and so on. So every conflict exists in a system bigger than itself. So what we do when a crisis happens, like a coup or an outbreak of violence, is we try to stop it. We try to push it down. So what you might know is those first two weeks after Ming Online stage a coup, there were many people, China, ASEAN, Europe, US ringing and trying to get him to stop the coup. Even the WA, Ming Online, please don't do coup. Japanese envoy, please don't do coup. You can stop this now. Try to reduce the crisis, the immediate moment. But actually, that kind of isn't enough because when we do crisis management, we are just dealing with this little issue. We are not dealing with all the other layers. And so what we saw in Myanmar happen was, yes, international community tried to stop the coup, stop the coup, but actually a new generation of young people who've been through a lot of training, a lot of awareness raising, they came on the street and they started to say not just no to Ming Online, they said no to the constitution, no to this parliament, no to military. They said many things. I think Ming Online was very shocked. So what they asked for was something different. They said we want a different sort of society. We want a social change. Not just we don't want Ming Online. They said that we want new constitution. We want federalism. We want um, power sharing. We want all of these demands they have. So actually what they have been asking for is really a different future for Myanmar. So even though you would think, I'm sure Ming Online think that, okay, I will just take power. Next week will be okay. We'll go on as usual. He got a big shock because he found that there's a new generation, maybe not just new generation, many people saying that, no, you cannot behave like this anymore. We want a different, it's not just about you being president. It's a much bigger issue. It's about our society. It's what kind of people we want to be. It's what kind of constitution we want. So these things take time. I don't want you to pay too much attention to that timeline, but here. This is when we put these two things together. I hope it's not too complicated. You can see that the issue is connected to immediate crisis response, but that actually these things, relationships, subsystems and systems require a different kind of response. They require us to be aware of what's going on. They require us to imagine a different kind of subsystem. Maybe in the field of education, you are also thinking about this. You are thinking, what kind of education system do we want in the future? What topics do we want to teach young people? What um, courses should people be offered to build a better Myanmar in the future? I'm sure all of you are thinking you want to teach peace building, which is why you joined this course, because you want to be building a different kind of society. So this work that you are doing, sometimes they're called decade thinking, is over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, what kind of vision do you have? for the education system in Myanmar? What kind of vision do you have for Myanmar? So this framework is really thinking about what's happening now. This is happening right now. 
all of these issues, issues around um, tap my door control, issues around people fighting back, people demanding different kind of systems and constitutions and laws, but also they are all operating about how you want to be in the future. When this framework was developed, it became clear that actually, <laughs> let me go further, that this is about the future. But in our conversations last week and today, some of you have alluded to the fact that there is also the past that we have to deal with. So we can dream a beautiful future, but we also have to think about the history that we've been through. So we talk about perceptions earlier. We were talking about, oh, we have this way of seeing it and this way of seeing it. So in history, there is the history that we just lived through last week, last year. That's a recent event. That's right. We all can talk about the coup because we all live through the coup. And some of us can talk about the last 10 years, the last 20 years. We can talk about the history when Tatmadaw changed. We can talk about peace process in 2012. We can talk about opening up of the country in the last 10 years. We can talk about economic improvements. We can talk about election in 2019. So there's a history that we all live through together. There's the history that just happened, like the foreign minister of China just visit Myanmar. That happened last week. So that's very recent. We all know about that. But the history that happened last 10 years, we lived through that one together. But then there's the history that our parents or our grandparents taught us. That's called remembered history. That's the history that your grandfather will tell you oh I remember when the Japanese invaded Myanmar this is what it was like or I remember when Aung San make a great speech then I can remember that or I remember when Manaplore fell that's a history that somebody told you but that you didn't leave yourself but then there's one more narrative Narrative is the story that we are told in our history books or from our families, from our culture that says the Arakanese kings were very great or the Burmese kings in Mandalay were incredible and they defeated Ayutthaya in Thailand. This is a stories that we've been told that come from hundreds of years ago. The Buddha came to Myanmar and traveled through Arakan. Uh, the Chinese uh, came down through Kachin State and invaded Myanmar. These are the stories that we are told from hundreds of years before. So when we talk about the past, the past is all four of these things together. When Ming Online does a coup, he make a speech that say that he is like a Burmese king. So he connect history from last year and from a thousand years ago in one moment. When he say Burmese king, everybody know what he means because you have been hearing the history of Burmese kings for a long time. Many things that he refer back from history to give him today legitimacy, to give him identity, yeah? Same as uh, many ethnic leaders will talk about 70 years, 70 years we've been struggling, 70 years. They use the history to give them strength, power, leadership, identity, da 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 da, da. So when we put all this together, now I'm really going to scare you. You can see that in a conflict, this very complicated, how do we come out of conflict? 
Because if we just talk ku, that's just one little part down here in the issue. But actually, we have to deal with all these things, the relationships between ethnic people and Burmese people, relationship between NLD and USDP, relationship between EROs and the Tatmadaw, relationships between Buddhists and Muslims and Christians, all these relationships we have to fix. The subsystems we have to deal with, how we teach history, education, health, um, security forces, uh, military forces, and then we have to deal with the big systems, the constitutions, the political system, the laws, the way we live together. At the same time, we have to deal with the past. Is the way we talk about the past true? And then we have to think about the future. What future do we want? What constitution do we want? What kind of federalism do we want? So what kind of military do we want? So what's very powerful is in this moment right now, on July, what are we on? July 8, 2022. We are living in this moment in the past and in the future and in the present. We are right here. And whatever we think, we are also thinking from our past and we are also thinking into our future. And in this moment, we are living with the issues, relationships, subsystems, and systems. So if you look at the top here, there are some questions for you. Who are we? As peoples of Myanmar, where have we come from? What is our history about? And then over the other side, where are we going? What are we going to do with all of this? trauma and violence and diversity and economics and natural resources. There are a lot of things to think about. And the question in the middle is, how are we going to get there? So these three very powerful questions. But also here is all the work we have to do. We have to think about the vision we want. What kind of relationships? What kind of social structures do we want? We have to think how to prevent this from happening again. This is prevention. Transformation. How do we move from this crisis into the next social change? There are many people thinking about this at the moment. How do we move from humanitarian crisis into real economic development for people? How do we move from this military system into a different democracy system? So this is a big question. How do we change from crisis to real significant change? How do we manage the crisis? There are many people thinking about that. How do we protect people? How do we keep people safe? How do we prevent executions? How do we um, feed people? How do we give them health care? How do we teach children? These are all questions for crisis management right now. And if you can take any more, how do we deal with the root causes? What is the root causes? How did this happen? Is it constitution? Is it racism? Is it, what is it that we need to address? So these five things we have to pay attention to all at the same time. That's why sometimes we feel tired and overwhelmed, no? It's because many things to do, no? And if that's not enough, we also have to think about the past. How do we get justice? So you saw that there are people now working in the international justice system in The Hague. How do we prosecute people in The Hague? How do we take them to the international court? You're also talking about different identities. AA said it today. She said, ah, now I want to be somebody building trust because we know that between religions, between ethnic identities, we actually have to change our concept, our identities. We have to think we are one people with many differences, not many people who are fighting each other. 
this is called renegotiating identity, is to think about yourself differently. And then we have to think how to help people heal. We have to think about how to tell the truth. I know Tanda really liked to talk about truth because there has to be a truth here. What really happened? And then last but not least, we have to think about how to tell new stories. Some years ago, I have a great privilege to work with Hope because she was doing very interesting work telling stories from the Bible in a new way. How do we hear the Bible through the ears of women? How do we read the stories of the Bible seeing that there were very many women leaders in the Bible. So she was very good in restoring, telling the story again in a new way. So how can we talk about the history of Myanmar in a positive way, in a way that young people feel proud and excited, not just negative? I think it's a lot to think about. So I hope you're going to think about this the whole week. I want to remind you, that we don't have to do this work by ourselves. You don't have to fix all the history and all the future just alone. Actually, it's very powerful for educators to think, how do you inspire your students to see their part? How do you become aware of the what you are teaching? Because what you are teaching is part of this framework. Yeah, You are teaching the past. And you are teaching the future and you are teaching politics, you're teaching law, you're teaching social science, many things you're teaching. So how you teach is also part of how we build the future and how we understand the past. So I think th we don't have to think that we have to do everything, but to see your place in this framework. I want you to think, what is my part here? How can I help think about where we've come from and where we're going into the future. You can see that the framework is not something far away from you. It's actually right in your classroom every day when you have these divisions and tensions. And what you can hear NLD people and USDP people talking about is long history and their narrative and their interpretation and then where they're taking the country is in very different directions. So. I hope the framework, every time you encounter the conflict in your everyday life, it help you to start thinking about what is this? Can we name this? Can it help us to reframe this, talk differently about it, change the narrative, give a different perspective? Because I think that's the key to being able to unlock how you go forward. Dialogue is one of the pathways. And dialogue is not just trust building, but also listening deeply and looking deeply like the camels, right? Is that you have to look beyond the shadows. You have to look beyond, is it frog or horse? There are many realities at the same time. So it's really a very big challenge for you. Actually, there are two things that I also learned today. One is really like how we have the possibility to change the past in the way that we talk about the past. So we think the past is set, but it's actually the way we talk about the past um, that can, can change what happened in the past. We can um, talk about the power of people's resilience. And I can remember now Tunda talking about the camels as being so resilient in the desert. And actually, if you think Myanmar people, you are very resilient. So we can talk about the violence of the past, but we can also talk about your power and your resilience as a people to keep going. So that's very powerful. Actually, you are changing the situation without even being aware. Is You chose to come to this class because you want to teach differently what you share with your students. And there are people writing new constitutions and there are people rethinking relationships in the country. And you are thinking what kind of education system you should be. So I think that you don't have to be the one to facilitate the dialogue between Ming Online and Aung San Suu Kyi, but you can, each and every one of you, be the people that guide your students to be thinking about these questions. Who are we? What do we want to be? Are we proud of who we are? Where are we going? 
Um, how should we consider our, our history and the stories we tell to each other in the classroom? How can the NLD and the USDP listen to each other? Strangely, NLD and USDP need each other, actually, in this situation. So how can we help people see that actually they are part of the same system and the same problem? So instead of arguing with each other, how can they come together and try to resolve many of the issues? USDP need the resolution as much as NLD need resolution. So actually you can be facilitators who help them come together. In this moment, you have also learned in Myanmar that there are many stakeholders and many people that need to be in the discussion to carve the beautiful future that you have. So thank you so much. 